everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, welcome to uh, my Q&A with Braceful. This is part of Backpage's digital slate of content that we've been putting out. And um, things are relaxing, as we know, around the UK, but we're still going to continue to put all this content to help you guys feel motivated and engaged with the acting industry, learn some bits that might help you uh, refine what you're doing at the moment. Um, and today we're joined by the amazing actor, Rafe Spall. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. I know that we've been trying to um, sort this out for a couple of weeks with the release of Tryin, which um, mm. I Told you that I binged over one day. Um, so um, I wanted to just start out by talking a bit about trying because that's the thing that's out at the minute. Yeah. Um, so yeah, tell us a bit about it in your own words, if you like. I'm, I'm pleased that you that you finished it in a day. I think it's uh, a good sign. Um, and I I knew I knew when I read it, it's the sort of show that I would like destroy in a day or two um, because it was it was really easy to read. And the thing is like what you learn over the years, sorry, there's kids in the background, you might be able to hear them. What you learn after doing it for a long time acting is that it's actually quite rare to see what you've read on the screen because it goes through so many different people and um, uh, uh, goes through such a big expanse of time before it reaches the screen that what you shot ends up being quite different to what it is, you know, with editing and blah, blah, blah. But this is one of the, first time in a long time that the show is exactly how I imagined it to be, which is lovely, because that's not always the case. Because we had such a good time filming it. It's a show about a couple trying to adopt, essentially. Um, we had such a good, rewarding time doing it um, that it would have been really disappointing had it not turned out how I wanted it to. Yeah. Thankfully, it has. But, you know, after doing, after one of the things I've learned is that you have no control over that. You, you have no control over the finished product. You know, that's, that's one of the things about being, about being an actor is your dominion, your, your influence on a project ends on your last day of shooting. That's it. Say goodbye. So you've got to do a bit of psychological work on yourself in order to stop the inevitable disappointment. Yeah. Because, because you will be disappointed when you watch yourself. It's just you, you are. Because when you're in the moment, you're not thinking about yourself. It's one of the reasons why we love acting so much is because you, you, you're out of your own head. You feel free. You feel you've zeroed yourself. It's like a deep meditation. So even though you're concentrating on it, you're feeling it, you're vibing, like you're, you're like really immersed in it. Yeah. You don't really know what it looks like. And then you watch it and you go, man, when I did that, I was really in the moment. When I watch it, now I, I can just see my big stupid head and like, you know, um, I sound really annoying, my voice is strange, blah, blah, blah. So what you've got to do is you've got to protect yourself from that by going, do you know what? The only thing that matters is the fulfillment I had making it. The quality and the success of the finished product are out of my hands. Yeah. That was a really long answer. No, no, it's, there's so many interesting things in there. <laughs> trying to pull out of that. How do you decide then from reading, when you're reading a script, how do you decide that it's something that you want to do? How mm. do you decide that? It's instinct, right? So, um, uh, I've, I've, re I've, re I've, re I've read a lot of scripts. That's that's what, what you know. As an actor, you're a sort of professional reader. It's 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 a it's a big part of your career. Uh, is is reading, even if you're just getting into it, you should have read all the great plays. I know it's a boring thing to say, but you sort of should because you need to know you need to know the landscape. You need to know the la the theatrical landscape that you're stepping into. You need to know about that. Um, so you read a lot, you've got to read a lot of plays and over that process of reading, you start to, you start to just work out what it is you instinctively relate to. And also you have an instinct about whether the thing that you're reading, that character that you've been sent, whether it's in your wheelhouse and if it's not, how you can create that, um, how you can get to a place where you can essentially play anything. Now, when I read this, I knew that this came would come very easy to me. Um, I didn't have to do an accent. I love doing <laughs> I love doing comedy. Um, it was just something I knew I'd be comfortable with. So that's appealing. Is that I knew that the words would fit in my mouth nicely. But other times, so I did a film called Just Mercy, where I played the district attorney of Alabama. That scared the life out of me. I was like, I've got to go and onto a film set and like 
be the district attorney of Alabama in front of 200 extras from Alabama and, and Jamie Foxx, who's the king of the South. Um, and like, go, here we go, guys, here it is. Like, I can do this too. So they appeal in different ways. Some, it, there's so much of a challenge that, that it's scary. And other times it's like, yeah, that's, that's going to fit me like a, a cosy blanket, you know? Yeah. Are there things mm. that, you've, um, that you've read the script for and you maybe have turned down um, that you've thought, I really wish that opportunity could come around now for me to sink my teeth into it? Has there ever been anything that you've turned down thinking, I might not be there yet to do that sort of thing, maybe when you were first starting out? No, because I think that what you... That I, I never turned anything down out of fear or because I thought I couldn't do it because I think, I think that you should, as an actor, feel like you're capable of everything. And then through a pre process of a long career, you realise what your limitations are. It's all about working out what your limitations are. And I think that every actor, when they put their head on their pillow at night, they know what it is they have to offer the world. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why it can be a really horrible job because unfulfilled ambition is crippling, right? And you're sat there and every night you're going to bed and you're going, man, I know I can do this. I know I've got this to offer. I know I'm better than these other people that I see. I know it. Or your voice is going, I'm not quite as good as other people. Whatever, whatever it is, right? You've got that deep burning voice inside you. Um, and so it's a process of actually understanding what your true limitations are. Um, and early on, you're, you're not scared of anything. It's not, you become sort of more scared. But in, in, in terms of what I've turned down i've never turned down things i've only not got two things that i've got very close to that i i do wonder what what would have happened had i got them yeah like big fat big fancy jobs big but, fancy jobs <laughs> yeah yeah I, there was two big there was two i was just went up in my mind about whether i was going to say it um do you know what? i don't care so i so i was nearly yeah so i nearly <laughs> so i nearly i was nearly I got quite close to being Doctor Who at one point, right? Wow. There's some big I don't care about talking about this. backstage, so that's, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, right. I got quite, and I didn't get it. And that was Matt Smith. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I was actually, in, I was close to being um, Doctor Watson in Sherlock. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So I, so I do wonder, like, what would have happened yeah had that had, had, I, had i got those shows and how that would have affected my career um but you know being an actor is it, it, just a for, look for every job i've got there's 500 i haven't yeah, yeah. and i've yeah. got great jobs and i've had a really lovely career and i'm incredibly privileged to be able to do that but there's some things that get away but i think you have to have the mindset as an actor that everything is for a reason and ultimately what's for you won't go, won't go by you now Martin Freeman and Matt Smith have got those parts that I mentioned. They're terrific actors. Actors that I love, that I respect, that were, were more right for the part. So I might have messed those up and then in turn and ended my career. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, every, I'm, sure <laughs> so, I'm sure not. So every, so every job you don't get, you've got to go, no, there was a reason I didn't get that. There was yeah. a reason. You have to tell yourself that, otherwise you will go nuts. Yeah. So let's talk about how you, how you became an actor and how you got into it, first of all. Um, yeah, could you tell us a bit about when you first started getting interested in acting and then how you progressed then? Because you, you went to National Youth Theatre, right? I did. So first things to say is my dad's a famous actor, right? So I always grew up around actors. And I grew up with a, a man in my house who was an actor, but not just an actor, a very successful one. So <clears throat> early on, I knew in my mind that that's what I wanted to do. And I was like, well... If I want to be an actor, then I'll surely be as successful as him because that's my role model. I'm going like, that's, that, that's just how it is. Ignorance and uh, naivety of youth. So I was like, yeah, I'll do that. But I was always, I didn't just do it because he was an actor. It was just this, you know, I think all actors listening to this will know that it's a thing deep within you. It's mm -hmm. a calling. Like we were talking briefly before we came on area, that it's a calling, it's a vocation that you can't describe. It's part of your soul. Um, but anyway, I was like, well, that's what I want to do. Uh, and he's one, so surely that will just happen for me. And then, but I didn't tell him because I was embarrassed. And then my dad overheard me say it to someone else. And then I did Bugsy Malone at school and I played Fat Sam. Nice. And, um, and uh, 
a really pretty girl called Tilly Mitchell called my house because she saw it and said she wanted to go out with me. So I was like, I'm definitely going to be an actor now. <laughs> and um, anyway, so Bugsy Malone happened. Tilly called me, became my first girlfriend. Then my dad said to me, would you like to audition for the National Youth Theatre? Because that's what he did. I said, yeah. He said, well, go and learn this speech. Um, for your audition and he gave it to me it was a speech from Julius Caesar he said learn it and come and do it for me and um, I did it and uh, he said he was as nervous as I was because it, it because if I was no good he'd have to tell me in order to save me from a life of misery but he saw something in me and from that point on he was very encouraging so then I joined the National Youth Theatre and it was it was um, life-changing that's all I can say. Totally life-changing. Because although my dad was an actor and there was actors that come round, I went to a, a, a um, state school in South East London where no one was really into acting. I was the only one really into it. So then I got, went to the National Youth Theatre. And I guess it's a bit like if you're good at football and then you play for your county or you play, you know, whatever, is that you go from being the best in your school to go into a place where everyone's the best in their school. Yeah. Right, that's the reason you get into the youth theatre because you're probably the best person at acting in your in your year or your school, whatever. So then you're like, oh, first and foremost, I feel like I found my tribe, my people. Mm. Like, and I, I'm I'm really thankful and I'm really delighted and proud of my tribe. Like I love actors, mm. I love them. I think they're open-hearted, beautiful, lovely, vulnerable, short, egotistical, solipsistic, but really fun company. Right? Yeah. And I get on with them and I feel an affinity with other actors. They're my people. They're simply my people. So I got there and I was like, right, these are my, I feel like I'm home finally. I feel like I found my people. And then you see how good everyone is. So you get an instant idea of, can I cut it at this level? You know, you know what? Maybe I can. Um, it's really nice to find other people that you can act with that give you, give you a lot back and make you raise your game. And still to this day, other people make you better at acting. Mm -hmm. You're only as good as the person acting opposite you. So in trying, say, I think Esther Smith's really good, yeah? So my, 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 I'm just trying to keep up with her. I'm not thinking about myself. I'm trying to keep up with her, right? Which takes you out of yourself. So what you remember? You've got to get out of your own head when you're doing acting. Concentrate on what's opposite you. Um, um, so anyway, did the youth theatre. And then I loved it. And then I didn't get into drama school. I auditioned for Rada and Lambda, I didn't get in. And how was that? that it was a kick, kick in the guts, yeah, because, because as I said, that's, my, that's what my dad did. And up until now, I'd mirrored my dad. I did the National Youth Theatre. I was like, well, this is going to be easy, mate. I mean, it, and he went to Rada, my dad was like, well, I'll get into Rada, didn't get in. And the um, best thing that could have happened to me, because at that time I was like, okay, this isn't that easy, is it? And it was my first, like, mm, this is really difficult. There's people out there a lot better than you, look what better prepared and you know. Yeah. So anyway, that that summer I went and did another show with the National Youth Theatre and I got an agent. And then thinking that I'd take a year off and re audition for drama school, but I just um <clears throat> ended up getting lucky and getting work. And in that first year I got I did a play at the Royal Court, play at the National Theatre. I did a terrible film. Um uh, <laughs> which uh, I really enjoyed doing. Um, and I just never got around to going to drama school. Yeah. And yeah. How, did, how, did, so how did that agent find you? Who was that agent that you had when you first started? She was called Pippa Markham. She came, she, <coughs> she oh. came and saw um, uh, a show at the youth theatre. So, um, you know, I, I, I get that for a lot of people, it's that first exposure, right? It's how you get that first exposure. And for a lot of people, it's, that's why they go to drama school, ultimately. Mm. And so you get a showcase at the end, because you've got to get seen. But look, I'm an unusual case because my dad is a famous actor. So I had an unfair advantage and, I, and I'm open and thankful and privileged for that, yeah? Now, that's an advantage in so much as if a casting director's got a list of people and they see that one of those people is the son of a famous actor, out of curiosity, they're going to want to get him in, see what they're like, yeah? But that, that, I like to think, is where the meritocracy fits in, is that you will get seen for a job because you've got a famous dad, but you won't get the job because you've got a famous dad. Right. And if you do get the job, 
then the next person who sees you be shot in that film won't give you a job again. Yeah, exactly. Right? So, so, so I'm very, very thankful for the privilege and the leg up and the nepotism that I benefited from. And I really marvel at people who do it without that shit because, you know, most actors, most people getting into it don't have that. And I, and I'm, and I, I, I doff my cap to those people. I, I really respect them. So you get a lot of advice from your dad now and when you were first starting out? Not on acting, no. We never speak, we never speak explicitly about acting, about like, look, if you just did this and this character, or this is a technique, never. That's always been a thing that has encouraged me to discover for myself. And a thing that ultimately you can really only learn yourself about how to get good at acting. Yeah. But we talk a lot about the business. We talk a lot about directors, cast and directors, because, you know, he's my dad, but he's still part of that tribe that I was talking about. Mm. Those like-minded people. Mm. And, and, and that tribe, like, I've been lucky enough to do films all over the world, right? Work in America, Australia, wherever. And actors are the same everywhere. And I did a play on Broadway about seven years ago. I did Betrayal by Harold Pinter. And that's a three-hander, and that was directed by Mike Nichols, and it was me, Rachel Weiss, and Daniel Craig, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm like 30 at this point, 31. And I'm in the middle of the play with these two movie stars. Yeah, all that movie stars. One's James Bond, and the other one's won an Oscar. And they're married. And I was vulnerable, and I was insecure, and the whole time I was like, why am I here? How did I get this? What the fuck? And then, and then on the opening night, first time I did it in front of an audience, looked in each other's eyes and it was the great equalizer because they were just actors and they felt exactly the same as me. Mm. Didn't matter, didn't matter the levels of success, the Oscars, the James Bond, didn't matter. We were all the same. And so that bond that you get when you act with people sustains forever, you know, because you, because you know that they're as vulnerable as you are. Mm. So no matter the success, the geography, the actor that that's why that that's, that's it's a very particular sort of person it really is and my dad my dad's the same as that do you feel like over the years that um vulnerability has or that belief in yourself has changed do you feel like you have more um yeah confidence in in your talent now than you did before i think I, in short yeah yes i do but it's more complicated um Uh, so I just did a play at the National Theatre, which was a one-person play at the um, um, in the cottage, in the Dorfman, mm -hmm. um, just before lockdown, actually. And that was thirteen and a half thousand words. That's played seven different characters, and uh, and I know after doing that, that actually nothing that it, I know what I'm capable of now in ways that I didn't before. So each job you're exploring yourself and you're realizing that you can, in fact, perform under pressure. So that's the big, that's the biggest thing. Mm. It's pressure. Yeah. Can you perform under pressure? That's one of the biggest things about acting. Um, and can you be confident? Uh, and can you stay relaxed? So those are the three things that I've learned over the years. I've learned that. So, so think, so going back to that, so that first night on Broadway, yeah? And like every famous person in the entire world was in the audience, right? Steven Spielberg, um, uh, Bruce Springsteen, Glenn Close, um, Bette Midler, Javier Bardem, Philip Seymour Hoffman, um, every head of every studio, um, Julia Roberts, um, Joe Biden, the vice president, right? Yeah. Literally, we're all in the audience. And I'm going out and I'm playing the main part on Broadway. Yeah, this is, this is what I dreamed of my entire life, right? And this is that small voice in my head. That's what I've been lying there going. I've been lying there going like, this is what I think I should do. I think I should be an actor because I think I can go and do plays on Broadway, yeah? But then you're confronted with it. Mm. Careful what you wish for. Here we go. Here we are. And... Uh, to not like fold at that moment is to not like run away screaming. Right. Not really fight that instinct. And I realize, and then, and then what you do is you go out 
And then you have two options. Do I just like try and stay alive or do I try and be free and creative when this huge pressure is falling on you, right? Um, so if you do it like a sporting analogy, it's like, if I'm, if I'm a batsman in cricket, do I go out and just defend the ball and try and stay in or do I play shots that I've never played before? Throw caution to the wind. Now that's really scary, yeah? Mm. And you only know the result of that if you've done it. And so you go like, do you know what, fuck it, I'm just going to be free and give it a go. And I, know, I now know that I can do that. Yeah. I now know that I can perform under pressure. So that gives you a confidence. That gives you a confidence that, that you can do it. And so when I did the play just now at the, at the, and again, when I'm on the first night of doing that one person show, I just had to remind myself that I'd never let myself down before. Yeah. It's like you've never, you've never folded before because that's the thing. That's the, that's the worry. You're going to choke. You're going to forget your lines. Everyone's going to laugh at you and you're never going to work again. But you go, well, no, I've never done that before. So that body of work gives you a confidence. Yeah. So before you had that proof of, right, well, I've, I've done this, that, and the other, I've never let myself down on any of these before. How do you have any like tips for how you dealt with the nerves and the, that pressure before you were? Proof? Yeah. Yeah. I think you have to use nerves as a tailwind, not a headwind, right? Because nerves can do one of two things. They can, push against you or they can push behind you. Now, if you think that when you, you know when you fall over, right? Mm. Just normally in everyday life, you fall over. You get a rush of adrenaline that goes through you. Yeah. As you're going over. Now, what that rush of adrenaline does is that makes your arms come out quicker. It makes you more alert. And it makes you faster of thought. So it's your body going, quickly be superhuman for a second to protect yeah. yourself. Now, that's what nerves are doing when you're getting into a pressurized situation of going to an audition or um, uh, getting up on stage. They can help you. They can make you a cleaner, faster, more concentrated version of yourself. Mm. You have to remember and do a lot of psychological work on the fact that that's what nerves are for. They're not there to impede you. They're there to help you. Nice. So what did you but say? You, but you've already, you've got to meditate on that. You've got to meditate on it. Right. Use nerves as your tailwind and not your... Yeah, not a headwind. Not a headwind. I like because it. Because a headwind will slow you down and a tailwind will make you quicker. Yeah. Um, uh, and you just got to... But that's a lot of deep psychological work you've got to do on yourself. But like anything in life, like life doesn't happen to you. It happens because of you. Success doesn't happen to you, it happens because of you. Mm -hmm. So you need to do a lot of work on yourself. You've got to make yourself stronger. But look, a lot of the reasons that people become actors is, is because you're a confident person. You're the sort of person who makes people laugh in your class or, or, or um, because you are the sort of person that can go out and talk in front of people. Because you are the sort of person who can get up and do a play. Yeah. So you've got to go like, this is what I'm built for. I do this because other people can't. Mm -hmm. Which again is working on your confidence. Yeah. You go, yeah. you know what? Like other people can't do this because if, if everyone could do it, then they would do it. Which again is listening to that voice in your head and trusting it. Trusting yeah. your instinct. Because the whole time, Everyone else, you know, you'll be getting bad reviews. You'll be getting people saying, are you sure you shouldn't pursue another career? Do something a bit safer. And all the time you've got these instincts inside you saying, nah, man, I, I believe I can do this. You've got to keep hold of it. You've got to keep hold of it. And that's the same thing that tells you how much talent you've got. It's the same thing that tells you how much bravery you've got. you just got to, because it's like a light, you've got to just hang on to it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and as mm. soon as that starts to waver in a big way, then, you know, that's what you need as an actor that confidence yeah, because, that freedom yeah, right. to be able to create and play with things and not feel embarrassed to to play with them in a new way but also fail yeah most of the time you will fail most of the time you won't hit it most of the takes you do won't work a lot of the plays that you do won't work you'll spend ages doing a film that meant so much to you 
and then you bring it out and everyone goes, yeah, it was all right. Because very few of the things that you do hit. That's the fact of life, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so the only thing that you can do is get better. The only thing that you have any control over is improving. You don't have any control over success or whether people will like things. That's by the by. All you've got control over is like imp improving and getting better. Yeah. And yeah. Figuring out what makes you good. Figuring out, figuring out. Hang on, there's someone pulling up my drive. <laughs> is it the waterman? Oh, it's, it's just a delivery. Uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, it's when someone comes out the drive now, it's like, who, who could this be? Is it the police? Um, uh, uh, figuring out that really the three cornerstones to me of acting, well, no, it, two, is co confidence and relaxation. Yeah. You've got to be confident, you've got to be relaxed, because you've got to be open. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm rittering on a lot here. I've got a lot to say about acting. I spend, no, I love I spend it. A lot of, I, We've got a chat box down the bottom and I can see so many people like amazing insight. It, it's all gold. So these are the, this is the right audience for all of this chat. It really is. Um, well, I, it's, my, it's my passion. It's my great passion. Yeah, exactly. And we were saying just before we, we came on and broadcast that you have to really want to be part of the world to be working in it, in casting and in, in acting and be obsessed with it. And I think it sounds like you're pretty much obsessed with it. <laughs> well, that's why, that's why you, you get like, you're, it's born in you. You're born with it. You don't ask for it. If anything, it's an affliction. <laughs> it's not a gift. It's like, you, you, you don't ask for this shit. You don't ask to like spend your life in, a, in anxiety and uncertainty and not knowing where the next job's going to come from. And, you know, by the way, I mean, this, this is the thing with lockdown, isn't it? It's like a lot of actors right now on lockdown, like, they, they, like a lot of the world now knows what it's like to be an actor all the time. Like I spent right. a lot of my time, like I spent a lot of, of my time, like sat in my pants drinking in the day, not knowing where the next paycheck's coming from. Like this is, this is generally just the life of an actor guys. You know what I mean? Like this, anyway, get used to um, it. Yeah, get used to it. Like now you know how we feel, right? Um, um, uh, yeah, it's uh, no, it's a thing. It's a thing that you don't ask for. That's why you can get kids that like, go to Eton, Cambridge, could go over millions of pounds in the city, but they just want to be actors, mm. right? Yeah. Because it's in them. And you know what? They would love to get a gig on Doctors or whatever, or, or, or in a site or whatever, because, because it's in them, because they, because they can't get rid of it. It's something you can't get rid of. You've got no choice. If it, if it happens to you, got, if you're in it for the right reasons, a lot of people aren't in it for the right reasons. If you're in it for the right reasons, you've got no choice. It just, it happens to you. Yeah, for sure. Mm. Um, I'm going to move on to some questions from our mm. audience. So, um, Randall Galera has asked, uh, what would you say has been your biggest change from your Shaun of the Dead days to now? And if you could go back and give some advice to your younger self, what would it be? Well, my biggest change is that I was a boy then. I was 18 when I did Shaun of the Dead. Uh, and I'm a man now with a wealth of experience. Um, I also went through a sort of physical transformation where I lost a lot of weight. And um, um, I, I wanted to do that in order to broaden the range of parts that were available to me. But I want to caveat that, mm. right? Because, because we as a culture are obsessed by weight loss, obsessed by weight. Um, and I think it's important to say that even though I'm thin, thinner, all my problems are still the same. Nothing's changed. I have to be, I think you have to be very careful of, of, of like getting the discourse across that fat, unhappy, thin, happy. It's just not true. Um, that was something I felt I needed to do because of the industry, because, because there isn't a fair representation of, of true society in the industry. As we know, we have not enough parts for people of color, for disabled people, um, um, marginalized people in general. And that, I think also, there's not a, there's not a lot of leading parts for, for, for larger people. 
mm. unfortunately. So I felt the need to sort of change myself there in order to fit in, which is a shame. And I don't think that's a positive message. I think it's a shame. Yeah. Um, um, and how else have I changed? I've got three kids now. Um, that uh, yeah, that'll do. That's quite a big change. And what would I say to my younger self? Uh, that's a good question. What advice would I give? It's fine to fail. It's fine. It's really fine to fail. Mm. It's really fine. You have to fail. The only way to get better is by doing it wrong. Yeah, great. And great. you're never going to get there. You're never going to get there. You are never going to get to a point where you feel like you've nailed it. You're never going to get to a point where you feel like you're finished. You're never finished. You never get to the point where you go, do you know what? Now I'm a good actor. That will never come. To use a, a cheesy phrase, it's the journey, not the destination. Because, you know, we don't want to get there, guys. We want to work out what it's like to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's not one holy grail of, of any career where you're going to be like, okay, I'm done now because you might just die if that's the end of everything. Well, exactly. Yeah, and also, also what I'd say is there is a very, and this is true, there is a very, very thin line between terrible acting and brilliant acting. And I really believe that. Now, now you need to be really, and I'll tell you the thing that links those two things is bravery. Yeah. You need to really be brave to be terrible in something. Mm -hmm. The actors that I, I would, I, I want to see actors put themselves out there, take some risks. Because anyone can keep their head beneath the parapet, do a bit of mumbly acting and pretend, and do you know what I mean? And be like, oh, you guys, don't look at me. But the actors that I've always responded to as my favourites are people like Gary Oldman and Jack Nicholson and Daniel Day-Lewis. Daniel Day-Lewis, they're big. They're big actors. And sometimes they get it really wrong. Hopkins get it really wrong. But I'd rather see strong and wrong, right, yeah. than, 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 than not than keeping it on the down low and playing to your strengths. Right. Like, like go hard or go home, right? Yeah. Like, let, let, like, like, be brave. And who cares if you fail? Because you have to fail to realize how to not do it. Yes, 100%. I like that. Uh, so, Ben uh, Holmquist, I've definitely not said that wrong. I do apologize, Ben. Um, he wants to know how. How do you like to develop a character and how do you do it differently depending on what type of project you're working on? So, I mean, like, in, like, well, he's answered the question for himself there. It's different. It's different for each project, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but the, but the, but the, but the, the thing that you arrive at is the same. It goes back to the fulfillment that you get out of being creative. Because that's what you're doing it for. You're doing it for the fulfillment, not for the success or not for the finished product, for the fulfillment in the moment of doing it. That's what we do acting for. We don't do it for status and glory and money and success. We do it for the, we do it for the feeling of doing it in the moment. Now, what is that feeling that we go for? That's called flow state, right? Now, flow state, you get that anything. You get that in any area of your life when you're doing something you're really happy doing. Flow state. Now, depending on what your idea is of, of, of like meditation or whatever, that, that's like meditating. It's, I touched on it earlier. It's like the zeroing of self where you're not thinking, you're just creating. That's why we do this. How do you get there? You need to have an unbelievably sound technique. You need to really know what you're doing. You need to really know the bones of the technique. So say like you can only play improvisational jazz if you know your scales like that. So they're in your DNA. Yeah. Right? That's being in your DNA. That's the only way you can then be creative. So you've got to know what you're doing. You've got, you've got to know your craft and your technique. Now, that's personal. Whatever it is that you feel like you've done the work, that's up to you. I don't need to know about that. But just do the work. It's private. And I think the actors who talk about what work it is they do, it's a bit both boring, cheesy, and, and I don't want to know about that. So I don't, I don't want to know about, I don't want to know about, I don't want to see the strings. So whatever it is you need to do, to feel like you've done the work, do that. And then 
come onto the stage or in front of the camera and throw it away. Yeah. And be open. Be open. Because because when you when an audience, you remember there's an audience watching you. You're doing it for them. You, you, you know, you're telling them a story, right? An audience doesn't care about you on your own. They don't care about your acting partner. They care about the energy that is created between you. That's what's exciting to watch. Mm. That organic thing that is created between two actors, that is what is exciting. Now, if I'm too in my own head, thinking about all the terrific work I've done, trying to get my emotional recall going, then I'm not thinking about the scene. And I'm not thinking about the other person. I'm thinking about myself. Right, uh, yeah. Right? So you've got to throw it away. Do the work. Know it's in you. I know it's there, but throw it away. And, and concentrate on the, on, your, on, the, on the person opposite you and be open. Be open. Now, it's a dangerous game to play, being open. Because sometimes it doesn't come. But again, going back to about being prepared to fail. I'd rock, so, say you've got to cry in a scene. Mm -hmm. Actors put a lot of pressure on themselves to cry. Go, oh, you're still trying to squeeze out your tears. Oh, my God, I just need to cry. You're not thinking about what's going on. You're not thinking about the scene. Yeah. You're just trying to cry. And it's phony. So I'd rather not cry and listen. And audiences will much more appreciate you listening and being in the moment and forcing out your phony tears. Yeah. I was going to ask right. you actually about Esther, you and Esther Smith on, on trying, because your chemistry is what is so enchanting about the whole thing. Well, it's what makes the show. Yeah, yeah totally. So did you, did you guys have to chemistry test? Be like, how did that come about with that? Yeah, we did a chemistry test. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we did a chemistry test. So we both auditioned. She auditioned separately, and then I was brought in to do a chemistry test with her. Yeah, we did. Um, because it's what the... It's what the show lived and died on, but it's what acting is all about, mm -hmm. chemistry. Now, what, it can be a bit annoying sometimes when, when you as an actor ask coming for a chemistry test. It's like, well, I'm an actor. I get chemistry with anyone who's good. Do you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> but I understand it. The people want to see it. I understand that. I do get it. But that is, but that is, it is, um, it is really what acting is all about, is chemistry and is that, as I said before, the thing that is, it's not you or her, it's the thing that's created between you. That's, that's magic there. That's what we do it for. Mm -hmm. And you only get that by being open. Yeah, cool. Uh, Grace Plant has asked, uh, oh, this is quite a long one. Hi, Rafe. I watched your recent interview on Saturday Kitchen and heard you discussing comedy. I'm a recent graduate who would love to pursue comedy acting, but my drama school was quite discouraging about people pursuing this. Have you got any tips for someone who's new in the industry who wants to focus on comedy specifically? I mean, what I, I, I don't know if I have any tips, but what I would just say is more power to you because you obviously want to do comedy because you're funny. Now, you know you're funny because you make people laugh in your everyday life, right? You know that. So let that, let, that be, let, let that be your confidence and your guide and your belief, is that you know you make people laugh. You know that when you stand up on a stage, you're able to get a group of people to laugh at you, which is powerful. Now, I don't know why they would discourage you from wanting to go, go into acting, I mean, go into comedy acting. It's probably because they're not funny themselves and they don't know how to do it because Comedy's binary. You're either funny or you ain't. You either have it in you or you don't. Um, so if you have it in you, look after that and protect it mm -hmm. because it is so valuable and it is such a valuable currency. Because let me tell you this, anyone can make people cry. Not everyone can make people laugh. It's a lot more difficult to make people laugh than it is to make them cry. So look after it. Believe in yourself. Um, uh, I mean, look, it's uh, the opportunities will come. Um, was it what was her name? Grace. Her name is Grace. Yeah. Yeah, Grace. Do you know what? what Grace. Let me tell you. Do you know what the world really wants right now? 
the entertainment industry, funny women. Yes. Okay, funny women. The world is, the, the entertainment industry is desperate for funny women. So this is your time, Grace. The world needs you and wants you. Yes, exactly. Um, so Tremaine Miller has asked, um, if you could get, uh, if you could give some sort of summary in your mind, what you've seen, um, the differences between working on US projects to those uh, which you've done previously in the UK. There's, there's, no dif there's, there's no difference. There's, let me tell you this. I've done films in America and I've done, and I've done films here, all over Europe. And I've done, I've done big franchise movies and I've done tiny films that no one will ever see. And I've done adverts early on in my career. The moment between action and cut on all of those projects is exactly the same. Exactly the same. The act of standing in front of someone, looking slightly past the camera with someone stood next to it, with them try trying to be normal and relating and creative, that's the same. Acting's acting. Yeah. Um, in America, they have better craft service and coffee. <laughs> that's it. That sounds all right there. Fair play. Yeah. Um, Charlotte Rhea has asked, uh, do you have a bad audition story you could tell us? Um, there's not one that comes to mind, but I've had thousands of bad auditions. I've had those auditions when you're in there and you're like, this is, this is not going my way. And then you feel the sweat start to pour down your torso. And you're like, I've got, this is, this is, this is poor. I'm being poor. This is terrible. They don't like me. They're never going to cast me. They knew from the second I walked in, they didn't want to cast me, but they're just getting through with, but it's, it's positive. It's all good. Cause you need to know, you need to know, you know, you just need to know, you need to know what that feels like because you need to know whether you can deal with it and take it because it's all rejection and it's horrible. And as I said earlier, for every 500 job, for every jobs I've, job I've got, there's been 500 I haven't. And um, part of being successful in this is realizing how much rejection you can take. It's a very, it's a big cliche, but it's true. So mm -hmm. I've got, I, I've had, I've had many terrible auditions. Um, but it's all part of the fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're all, there's always good stories that come out of those bad experiences as well. That you can... Yeah. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. 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 It's what makes us all human. We can't all be perfect all the time. And do you know what? It's really lovely how open and honest you'll be in because like I said to you earlier, the audience are mostly actors. They, they are mostly actors who are just starting out or are yeah, yeah. their way towards things. So it's really nice that, that you've been able to be so um, honest. <laughs> and well, I love talking about it. I love talking, but it, you know, this is another reason why I love actors. Yeah. Um, is, is most of the time we don't sit there. We don't sit there talking to each other about how great we are. We sit there making each other laugh, talking about how shit we are. Right. <laughs> talking about, talking about the ways we humiliated ourselves. Right or a way that we were at an embarrassing audition, or we don't sit there going, oh yeah, I'm gonna work with blah, blah, and I'm a really cool dude. We all sit there laughing at the fact that we're all shite, right? <laughs> that's, that's, one, that's one of the things that bonds us together because we constantly operate from a place of fear. Now, that to me is one of the reasons why actors have traditionally called each other love and darling and sweet and all that sorts of thing, because it's an immediate intimacy. Because we're all frightened and we're all scared. And we're all operating from a place of fear and we're only got to our last job. And, you know, I'll do a, a big name drop now, yeah? Because I, I once met Al Pacino, right? Mm. And I was with this other actor called Bobby. They'd worked with Al Pacino. They did a film together. And, and Bobby said to Al Pacino, <laughs> he, said, he said, hey, Al, I saw some of the film we did. He said, oh, you're terrific in it, Al. And Al Pacino was like this. Really, Bobby? Oh, that's good news. Oh, thank God. 
really is good. I was good. Al Pacino, still worried about being good in a film. Oh, wow. Still looking for affirmation. Still looking, still looking for people to say that they think he's good. It's fucking Al Pacino. Al Pacino, yeah. man. Wow. It never ends. It ne that's why we're a tribe. Because we know what it's like. Because you're in the club, mate. You're in the place of fear. You know what it's like. Mm. Anyway. Yeah, love it. Really mm. nice. So, um, oh, I saw something somewhere the other day that they are going to run another series of trying. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hoping to start shooting that in September. Okay, amazing. So, um, how has everything been going for you with, I don't want to talk about COVID too much because it's mm. by this point, but how are you... Um, how are you coping and like how what's been happening with all your projects that you've had do you know what i got i, I got incredibly lucky and blessed and, and i i i've just finished the platinum national a week before lockdown and then um trying second season was supposed to start in august and now hopefully we'll start in september so i had this a lot of time off anyway so i'm 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 lucky and, and thankful amazing have you been doing anything mm. that you would recommend to anybody else to keep yourself sane apart from drinking in your pants like um yeah yeah but that <laughs> tends to catch up on you. you you work out that maybe 350 units of alcohol a week aren't that healthy um so um uh what, what have i been doing try not to read the news too much just makes you anxious yeah, uh also. you know yeah try not to do that and um you know if you just started it's been a good time to have some reflection on what it is you want out of this life and be confident guys. Like if you're an actor and it feels insecure right now and uncertain, just remember this is that everyone's been sat at home watching telly. We've never been more needed Act actors and storytellers, you know, people, people look to stories and entertainment. We're needed and we always will be and know that even if it's tough now, it's going to get better. And one of the things that I think we've realized out of, out of all this is that we need entertainment. We need escapism. And when that comes in, we come in. So things are going to, it's, it's good. It's, it's going to be a good time to do what we do. Yeah. I think the industry is going to change that is much more um, helpful to actors as well in that. Well, I mean, it's always better to be in, in the room for a casting because you can bounce off people and get direction to guide the performance. But I think if you're living outside of London, like we were talking about earlier, then we're going to have more accessibility to you with casting tapes is going to become even more of a thing now. So I think the industry is going to change in, in a good way as well. As yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I hope so. And I, I want it to become more inclusive. That's what's really important. Yeah, for sure. Mm. Okay. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it and being so open. It was really lovely to talk to you. I've loved it. I've really loved it. I, you know, I love talking about acting and, and I, I, I love actors and I, I've said it a million times, but I really do. It's my great passion in life and uh, the only thing I really know anything about. And um, I'm always happy to talk about it and talk about how much I love it. And, you know, because I spend a lot of my life thinking about it. Yeah. Same here. Mm. Um, if you guys want to tag us on Backstage, uh, we'd love to see your comments. We're at Backstage on Twitter and at Backstage Cast on Instagram. We've got loads more content coming up over the next few weeks, uh, so keep an eye. And um, yeah, thanks again. And please watch Try In. I, I really, really recommend it. And we've all got time to binge, guys, so just watch it. <laughs> Please do. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your questions. And thanks for, thanks for watching. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye.